to see uh, all of you. Uh, looks like we have a lot of people back home from spring break, so good to see you back and that you had a safe trip wherever y'all went to. And um, Obviously, just always good to be back together and, and worshiping God together. Uh, a couple weeks ago when me and Emily got back <laughs> uh, from Israel and we were over there for two weeks, um, obviously, thank you for your prayers and safe trip, especially when Gaza was shooting missiles at us. Made me feel a little better. Uh, people keep on asking me, like, what was my favorite part of the trip? And I kept on telling people, uh, when we landed down in Atlanta, and I walked outside in the fall, you know, the humidity hit my sunglasses. And I was like, I'm home. Um, but uh, obviously, it was just really neat. And uh, people have been asking me if I would do something about it, maybe like a Bible study and show some of those pictures. And I'd be happy to do that. Uh, but what I'd like to do is maybe do that not during worship period and not during Bible class time, but I'd rather do that maybe on the weekend or maybe in the afternoon. And maybe we can get some people together and I can turn that into a Bible study and we can put some passages to some historical sites. Uh, so if you would be interested in seeing something like that, please come and talk to me today. Um, and maybe we could find a time that's kind of good for everyone. And I'd like to do something like that and have a little bit of a Bible study and talk about some of these historical places and how archaeology has been proving the Old Testament over and over again that it's correct. And I think that would just be helpful and, and certainly nice. Uh, so talk to me about that at the end if, if you'd like to be a part of something like that. Now, 2 Timothy 3.16, passage I think a lot of people read uh, maybe today or the past couple days in the Bible class in the back. And of course, I think we're all familiar with what it says, even if you already turned there. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's probably for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, right? We keep on reading, but we understand the gist of this. That all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for, number one, doctrine, right? The things that God wants you to know to be saved, the things that God wants you to know to be in fellowship with him... You've been given the scriptures, and they're the authoritative message of God. It's God-breathed, right? Have any of y'all been studying with someone, and you read them this passage, and they turned around and looked at you and said, but the New Testament isn't scripture? It's kind of a New Age thing. Uh, and it seemed to kind of come out of the 80s, and you can find stuff about it in the 90s, and now even more so, it seems to be kind of like a growing trend to believe that 2 Timothy 3.16 is only talking about the Old Testament. And maybe some of you have seen that already. Well, what we're going to do this morning, it's not really, not really going to talk about 2 Timothy 3.16. We're going to answer this question. Is the New Testament Scripture? Because more and more so, there's a lot of people that do not believe it's Scripture. Uh, several of them, brethren, that do not believe that it's Scripture. And so I really want to have three goals here in answering this question. Number one, I want to make some preventative measures that I want to go ahead and be prepared for this and that we have a good answer for this. So later on down the road or maybe even right now, if someone comes and asks us and makes us question, wait just a second, is Paul here talking about the New Testament, that we would have a good answer for that and we would be prepared. The second thing I want to do is, again, more of that preparation that we actually do know how to respond to someone who asks us this question. Because if you say, you know, well, of course the New Testament is Scripture, of course the New Testament is authoritative, they're going to take you to 2 Timothy 3.16, and they're going to take you two verses back to when Timothy, is said that Timothy knew the Holy Scriptures from childhood. And they're going to turn around and go, well, what Holy Scriptures did Timothy know from childhood? It certainly wasn't the New Testament. Because when Timothy was a little kid, the New Testament probably had not even been written yet. And so they'll try to use that as a message to say, well, the New Testament isn't Scripture. And maybe if you're like me, you'll get caught kind of flabbergasted, like, I don't even know where to go now. And so I want to have some preparation in that manner. And number three, finally, my mission with this is I just want you to have some confidence in the books that you have right in front of you. And put some confidence that the New Testament is in fact scripture. And that based off the words of the New Testament, we can have hope that we do have eternal life. And that we are practicing what Jesus would have us to do. Is the New Testament scripture? Obviously, going into this, and the reason why we're having to talk about this is because many say no. Many say the New Testament is not Scripture. And just to give you three theologians that have put out books from the 80s all the way up to 2010, Mark Allen Powell said, the authors of the New Testament books did not know they were writing Scripture. That they had no idea at all that God was planning on using their message as authoritative for all time. And again, maybe I understand the concept of 
maybe Paul and Luke didn't understand how the New Testament would be formed as a unit. And I can understand that Luke may have not known that Peter's letters would have been added and been part of the canon. I understand that Paul may have not known that this specific Corinthian letter was going to be spread out to all places and be used for all time. But they did know that it was authoritative. And they did know what they were writing were scripture. Uh, as well, H.Y. Gamble said this, None of the writings which belong to the New Testament were composed as scripture. They were written for immediate and practical purpose within the early churches. And only gradually did they come to be valued and to be spoken of as scripture. And what's most sad about this is you're not hearing this all the time from the denominational world. You're not hearing this from the world of nonbelievers. A lot of times the people that are reading these books and repeating this are brethren. And they're coming up with these ideas saying, okay, well the Old Testament scripture for sure and what the apostles did was leave us just some guidelines, uh, just some kind of you know, basic instructions that really don't have to be followed, but they would have helped the New Testament church to get going off the ground. Never really authoritative. They should not be valued as scripture, right? And that was some kind of modern day invention that we do that today. And finally here, Lee Martin McDonald said, Paul was unaware of the divinely inspired status of his own advice. And I, I don't mean to laugh in a sense of just playing this as something foolish, but it, it, it's really strange, isn't it? That people have kind of come to this, that they believe that Paul, when he was writing, was like, no, I'm writing this stuff down. Who knows if anyone's going to use this? It's kind of my advice. And then you read a book like Galatians, and you're like, Who, what kind of Paul is he talking about? Because that's obviously not the same Paul. And, but this is, a, again, a kind of a common belief in something that's kind of getting running, that, hey, the New Testament isn't really Scripture, and many say no. One thing I want to bring up about this that I'm going to bring up at the very end is all three of these men are not historians. They're theologians. And, and as a theologian, you can kind of get away with writing any book you want to write. And no publisher is going to stop you or fact check you, because a theologian can kind of say whatever a theologian wants to say. And it can get published and get out there, and then many... Many of those that believe in Jesus may start believing this as well. Well, many say no, that the scriptures, the New Testament isn't scripture. But frankly, to make it a very easy answer here at the very beginning, the apostles say yes. Is the New Testament scriptures? Well, the apostles say it is scripture. Let's look at some passages with me. Go to 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14. Here, Paul giving instructions about worship. And what he as an apostle expects out of worship and what ultimately Jesus expects out of worship. And after kind of summing some things up of the way he'd like it to be handled and conducted, he says this, verse 36 of chapter 14, Or did the word of God come originally from you? Or was it you only that it reached? If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual... Let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. But if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant, right? Paul here basically is making the statement that there's anyone here that's reading 1 Corinthians and they consider themselves to be a prophet or they consider themselves to be spiritual. Paul's like, guess what? Here's your standard. It's 1 Corinthians. If there's a prophet or a spiritual person that doesn't agree with 1 Corinthians, then Paul says they are wrong. I'm the standard. What I write is the standard as his power as an apostle. Not only that, but he calls this letter as the commandments of the Lord. When we hear the word commandments of the Lord, what do we think of? Do you think of the Ten Commandments, right? The ten, uh, two tablets of the Ten Commandments, Moses carried down from Mount Sinai at first. God wrote them with his own finger. And what does Paul compare his letter to? It's the commandments, isn't it? It is just as significant as the Ten Commandments themselves is 1 Corinthians. So evidently, is the New Testament scripture? Paul says, yes. Look as well in Galatians 1. Uh, some of the most strongest language, or maybe harsh language in the New Testament, is talking about this topic. Galatians chapter 1 here, starting in verse 6. Paul has already come through in his first missionary journey. He's converted many in the area of Galatia. And he's gotten word that they have just simply dropped the gospel and gone after something different. Verse 6, he reprimands them by saying this, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him 
who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you, then what we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now we say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you, then what you have received, let him be accursed. <coughs> For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. We'll continue reading this in just a second. But they make this point very clear that Paul makes very clear. Paul's writings is the standard. And he uses this such strong language. He says, if you disagree with me, you are bound for eternity in hell. That's what a curse means. If you disagree with the apostles, you are going to hell. That's how strong Paul feels about this. And not only is it anyone else, he says if an angel of heaven disagrees with the apostles, they are going to hell. And he even goes a step further. He says, if I, if I come in later and I disagree with I, what I told you originally, he said, I'm going to hell. Because the apostles' message was authoritative. It was from God, right? And so why is this? Why is this so strong language? We just gave the answer. Here it is in verse 11. Verse 11 of Galatians 1. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me was not according to man, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul says, I got this from who? I got this directly from Jesus Christ. And so anyone that disagrees with the writings of Paul or the writings of Peter or the writers of John is ultimately disagreeing with who? Jesus Christ. And when you disagree with Jesus, now it does make sense why you've been accursed to hell. Because he's the only way to salvation. He's the only way out of hell is Christ himself. And finally, let's look at one more passage where the apostles say yes. And this is kind of the field goal that wins the game. 2 Peter 3.15. This is the passage to remember if you're in any conversation with someone about this. Though, of course, Corinthians and Galatians is helpful. 2 Thessalonians 3 is helpful. 2 Peter is the final blow. 2 Peter 3.15, Peter's epistle actually writing and talking about Paul's epistles, says this in verse 15. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, and also of all of his epistles, speaking of them and these things which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist their own destruction. And we can stop right there. And we can make the point very clear. Where does Paul's information come from, according to Peter? It's the wisdom of God, right? Could we just stop right there and say, okay, if Paul's writing the wisdom of God, then he's writing scripture? We could stop right there, I think, and make that point. But we don't have to, because look what he says next. Very next phrase, the very last phrase of verse 16 as they do also the rest of the scriptures, right? He says, look, Paul's epistles are from the wisdom of God, but there's people out there that are corrupt and they're unstable, and they're trying to twist his epistles just like they twist all the rest of the scriptures, right? What is Peter saying? Peter is saying that Paul's epistles are scripture. Peter groups Paul's letters with all the other scriptures. So just go ahead and answer the question right now again. Is the New Testament scripture? Peter says yes. Paul says yes. And ultimately, if we've endorsed Peter and Paul, we've endorsed them all, haven't we? If we've endorsed Paul, well, then we've endorsed Luke, who did the writings majorly for Paul. If we've endorsed Peter, we've endorsed John. And now we have the whole complete set, don't we? that we do know that the New Testament is scriptures since the apostles who actually wrote it said yes. Let's continue, though, even more. I think we may understand it now because a lot of times this conversation continues to go on even if you've shown passages right from the original source. If the New Testament 
is not scripture. There's conveniences in saying no. And what I'm trying to do here is really get to the heart of this issue. It's not an evidence issue. It's not that someone's been reading the New Testament and they've come to this conclusion. What's really going on is there is a heart issue that wants something. And when the heart wants something, it doesn't matter how much evidence is against the heart. It's going to take what it wants. So think about this for just a second. If the New Testament is not Scripture... There's some conveniences that now have been allowed if we believe that. Number one, if the apostles do not have absolute authority, then we all get to participate in the pick and choose gospel, which is we get to pick what's authoritative in the New Testament, and we get to pick what's not authoritative in the New Testament, right? So if we disagree with Matthew 19 about divorce and remarriage, we simply can say, well, that part of Matthew is not authoritative. But if we do agree with what God says about salvation, then we get to say, well, this part of the gospel is authoritative. And what are we participating in? The pick and choose gospel, right? You like Matthew? You can keep Matthew. You hate Acts? Throw it away. You can, right? Because nothing's truly authoritative anymore. You get to be the absolute authority of God's will for you, right? Or I put here in first person, I am the absolute authority of God's will for me. In simple terms, what is the convenience of saying no? You can do whatever you want. That's what it means, right? Now I can do whatever I want, and no one can say anything against me. And if someone brings me a New Testament passage and says, you call yourself a Christian, and yet the Apostle Paul says this, you can go, well, I I don't really know if Paul's words are Scripture. And now the conversation's over, right? Because you don't even believe in the source material anymore. I don't understand how you can even know who Jesus is if you don't believe in the source material, uh, but that's another problem. There's a convenience in saying no, that the New Testament is not Scripture. Now there is perfect unity among all beliefs and doctrines. So it doesn't matter really what you believe. We're all going to the same place, right? You get to say things like, it doesn't matter what you teach, and I teach is completely contradictory because we all worship the same God. And so, you know, we might as well go ahead and hold hands with all denominations and all beliefs. Now there's perfect unity, right? When you read things from the 1800s in America, or even the early 1900s, denominations in America did not used to play together well. They couldn't stand each other. And they would debate each other. And they would fight each other. And in their pulpits, they would condemn each other. Now today, I don't see that as much anymore. It seems like most denominations today, and maybe you disagree with me, are actually trying to hold hands. And they're trying to work together. And they're trying to say, you know, unity is important. And they they try to do things together. And they don't say anything bad about each other anymore. And frankly, a lot of brethren envy that. And so what do brethren have to do so they can put down the walls of doctrine and go and hold hands with anybody? Well... You've got to start saying the New Testament isn't Scripture anymore. It's hit or miss. It doesn't matter what it says. And now we can hold hands with people. Let me give you one motivation for maybe why people are wanting to do this besides the concept of just wanting to be unified. Ultimately, I think maybe what brethren are is they're scared. And let me reference something from Jeremiah 42 that we've been talking about recently where basically you see an instance where the Israelites become best friends with their enemy because they're afraid of the Chaldeans. In Jeremiah 42, there's three players. You have Egypt, you have Israel, Judah, and you have Babylon. And what we see here in Jeremiah 42 through 46 is Jeremiah is telling the people of Judah, do not trust Egypt, do not be so afraid of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, that you're going to go and flee to Egypt. Don't trust in Egypt. But what do the people do? They trust in Egypt. And they end up being destroyed for that, don't they? Well, you think about what Egypt and Israel's relationship has been through all the years. Was not Egypt their worst enemy? I mean, Egypt enslaved them for like several hundred years, right? God had to send the plagues to free them from Egypt. And and then Pharaoh changed his mind and and tried to come and get him at the last minute. And God had to save him by the Red Sea. Then they go on and Egypt's down. They're not able to recover from that. But David comes, and Egypt won't mess with David. Solomon comes, Egypt isn't going to step foot in Israel when Solomon's king. But what happens as soon as Solomon dies? 
Egypt goes, Israel's weak. Let's go get them. And Egypt becomes the first people to come and raid the temple and steal all the treasure that Solomon had put there for the house of the Lord. Egypt is Israel's arch enemy. But because Israel is so afraid of the Babylonians, what have they done? They're trusting their enemy, aren't they? They would rather hold hands with Egypt than hold hands with God. They are more afraid of the Chaldeans than they are afraid of the living God. They trust Egypt more than they trust the living God. Does that all make sense, what's going on there in Jeremiah? Now, let, let me take it back a step to where we're, we're sitting right now. I think there's a lot of brethren right now that are terrified of the U.S. government. And Satan is playing us like a fiddle through our 24 hours news media. And he is keeping us afraid. And he is keeping us terrified of what the future of Christianity is going to be in this country. And brethren are so afraid right now. What do they want to do? They want to go join forces with people they completely disagree with. Because they think it would be safer to be safe in the denominational world. And to stand together as one big denominational world. Than it would be safer to stand with the living God. And their own fear has driven them to hold hands with all these groups that don't believe in this at all. Because they're putting their trust in the denominational world than putting their trust in the living God, right? And we're more concerned about turning the general term of Christianity into a political uh, party rather than you know, being concerned about worshiping God. And we're thinking, okay, well, if we can join forces with this denomination, and we can join forces with this denomination, we can keep the government at bay. If we join forces with these denominations, we, we can put a, a person in power that we all voted for because we'll be work as one unit now. we got to come together to survive. And I've just been here. Jason, do you hear this too? We have preachers that come to our building, and they want to talk to us, and they tell us these things. They say, guys, we got to get together. we got to stand together to survive. But to stand with them, what do we have to do? We have to stop saying that this is authoritative. We have to stop saying that the New Testament is Scripture. And frankly, where I'm at right now, I'd rather trust in the living God. I'm going to stand with God when things get bad. And when God tells me it's going to be okay, the Chaldeans are going to mess with you, I'm going to believe God. And I'm not going to run to people that don't consider God's word to be authoritative to save me. If we stand with the living God, we're going to end up saying that the New Testament is, in fact, Scripture. One more thing here. The convenience of saying no, then the gospel is not as simple as it really is. And if the gospel isn't as simple as it really is, then technically we don't have to obey it because we can't understand it anyhow. Look at 2 Corinthians 11. Maybe a go-to passage, I, maybe I read too much. <laughs> but it always gives me the answer that, that, that needs to be said. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Paul tells this to the Corinthians. He says, Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly, for indeed you do bear with me. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband, and that I present you a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted for the simplicity that is in Christ. And he goes on to say something similar that we see in Galatians. If anyone preaches another Jesus whom we've not preached, if you received a different spirit which you've not received or a different gospel which you've not accepted, you may well put up with it. He says, just like Satan tricked Eve, I'm scared someone's going to come in and tell you the gospel is more complex than it is. And they're going to rob you from the simplicity that's in Christ. Because ultimately, the gospel is supposed to be simple. And it's supposed to be easy to understand. And if we start telling people to take their nose out of the gospel and to put their nose in a theology book, what happens? Christ now becomes complex in their mind. He becomes too hard to understand. And what we try to do with our own confusion is use it to justify our sin. We say, well, now I'm going to go participate in this because you can't really understand what the gospel says. And it's so sad that we live in that world and we've been doing it for so long. A lot of people are born on this earth not believing that the gospel can be understood. And again, Satan has played us once again. 
Just like he played Eve by making the commandment not to eat the tree just a little more complex. By saying, you know, actually this will make you like God. It makes it confusing and now she's robbed her and us of the simplicity that's in Christ. There is convenience in saying no to this, right? Let's look at this on the other side. But what are the consequences of saying no to that? Are there consequences for saying that the New Testament isn't Scripture? Well, if you say that the New Testament isn't Scripture then you no longer have fellowship with the apostles. You don't agree with them. Look at Acts 2.42. Hear the story of the early church. Peter's delivered his sermon. They're meeting in the temple with one accord. He talks, talks about you know, the continuation of their story. We're going to flip to these passages next fast. And I'm going to flip with you, but uh, we're going to have to read a lot in just a little bit of time. If a Christian says no, then he has no fellowship with the apostles. Look here in verse 41 of Acts chapter 2. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. He doesn't say God's doctrine. He doesn't even say Christ's doctrine. He says the apostles' doctrine doctrine and fellowship, right? You know, whose fellowship are we a part of? All those other answers would have been good, but the answer Luke gives is the apostles. Because the only way to God for us is through the apostles' fellowship. So when people say, you know, what fellowship you're a part of, saying the apostles' fellowship is a good answer. It's a biblical answer. If we have no fellowship with the apostles, brethren, well, because we disagree with scripture, well then frankly, we have no fellowship with Christ. Because the apostles is the only way to get to Christ. Look at 1 John. Turn all the way back to 1 John. And in just a second, we're about to come all the way back up to the book of John. Now, first, let's go all the way to the back. John here covering the issues that we're talking about right now. John the apostle says this in verse 1 of chapter 1 of 1 John. That which we have beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father, was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Why do I write to these things to you? Because I have fellowship with Jesus. And if you have fellowship with me, us, the apostles, then you will have fellowship with Jesus, right? He even says it even this more strongly in chapter 4. Flip a couple chapters over. Four chapter, chapter 4, verse 6. Just one little phrase here. Talking about don't listen to the world, listen to the apostles. He says, we, the apostles, are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. How do you know what's right and what's wrong? How do you know what's from God and what's not from God? Well, he says, if you're of God, you hear us, the apostles. If you reject the apostles, well, then you're obviously not of God, right? Because the only way to get to Jesus is through the apostles, right? And even think about this. Go ahead and turn to the Gospel of John. Let's talk about we don't have any fellowship with God. But as you're turning there, think about this for just a second. If we didn't have the apostles, would we even know who Jesus is? We wouldn't even know that Jesus was a person. Maybe we'd have a little blimp from Josephus, but we would have just cast it out. It wouldn't have been common knowledge. And instead, Jesus is the most famous person that's ever walked on the face of the earth. And it's because of the work that the apostles have done. John 14 Verse 6, Thomas asking the question, you know, where you're going, how can we follow you? And Jesus says this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If the only way to Jesus is through the apostles, well, the only way to God is through Jesus, right? Look as well in chapter 16, verse 12. Jesus connecting the full loop, talking to the apostles. He tells them in verse 12 of chapter 16, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, 
He will guide you into all truth. He will speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me and take care of his mind and declare it to you. All things that the Father is are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Jesus says, I am the only contact to God. And so what I'm going to do for the apostles is I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to come and work with the apostles to guide them on all truth, to give them a perfect understanding of what needs to be said so that all others can have fellowship with the apostles, which will in turn have fellowship with Jesus, which in turn will have fellowship with God. The New Testament scriptures is the only way we can have fellowship with God. So if we rejected the New Testament as scripture, then what have we done? Well, if we have said no, we're still dead in our sin, we have no reconciliation to God, and we are without hope. We're doomed. You see here the New Testament scriptures is an all or nothing. You take it or you don't. There's no halfway ground. If you reject the New Testament as scripture, you no longer have any hope at all. And frankly, when you go to Mark... And you see Jesus talking about the unforgivable sin, the rejection of the Holy Spirit. What is he talking about? He's talking about this. If you reject the word of God, you will never, ever, ever be saved. Because as long as you are rejecting the word of God, you have no doorway to hope. What's the solution? Accept the word of God, and now you can't have hope, right? This is the ultimate consequence of saying no, and I think people don't realize how bad this is uh, unless you go ahead and you break it down this way. The New Testament is Scripture. Here's another consequence of saying no. You're in a really bad spot. Basically, the people that I've grown up with that are dealing with this, uh, you'll do this and you'll talk to them about it, and then the next thing they'll do is they'll start to try to go into Judaism. And they'll talk about how, you know, we need to be Jews, and they almost like kind of play on this mindset that they're going to become Jewish. And honestly, I don't even know where that's coming from. Because if you go into Judaism, you can't do anything. I, I mean, like, all the righteous requirements of Judaism are gone. Are you going to go to the temple? The temple's gone. Are you going to go make a sacrifice on an altar? Number one, like, no government's going to let you kill an animal like that anymore. And, and number two, what altar are you going to go to? And I just feel like that's such a lost way to go. I don't even know where to go with that, and I try to make those points. The other direction sometimes they'll go is here. They'll try to make a historical argument with me and try to convince me that basically the Catholic Church or man in general has corrupted the New Testament so badly that there's no way that we could understand the Scriptures for the way that Jesus would want us to understand them. And what they'll do is they'll try to reference the Council of Nicaea. They'll try to reference the Council of Hippo in Africa in the 400s. And they say basically that these men got together and they decided what the New Testament canon was going to be. And it was 400 years after Jesus and they just kind of made some things up and they were malicious in it and all this story. I have several problems with this. Number one, the majority of what people know about the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Hippo is not what they've read in the history book. It's because they've seen the movie The Da Vinci's Code. The Da Vinci's Code is a fictional movie about a fictional book for about a fictional story. When The Da Vinci Code goes in that movie and they explain everything about the Council of Nicaea, every bit of it is wrong. It's not even close to what happened at the Council of Nicaea. The other thing that they do is they've been reading these theologian books instead of reading history books. The history books, most of the time, not all the time, are concerned about the facts. What do the primary sources ha say about what happened at the event? The theologian books, they don't care about the facts. They're going to tell you what they think happened. And no one's going to be any of the wiser to tell them, no, that's not what happened. If you want to do a study about what happened at these councils, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about it. And I do have some good primary sources I can recommend, and you can research those things. But just trying to give you an overview of what happened at these things, guys, the New Testament books at those councils were never in question. Everyone had already accepted the New Testament books. It was 400 years after the fact. And the Christians, the early Christians, had already handed this to them. The codex, the book. They invented this technology. 
And all the New Testament books were already in them. And they handed them to them. The New Testament books were never in question. They were already accepted. The few times they did talk about books, they wanted to talk about three books. And they were all in the Old Testament. It was Esther, Nehemiah, and Song of Solomon. And they would try to debate on whether these books should be in the canon. And every time they had that conversation, they always decided, well, you know what? And all the other canons, they're in there, so we should put them in there. And so those were the only three books in question, and of course none of those are in the New Testament. The few times the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Mary got brought up, people laughed at them and threw them away. Because if you read those books, you can easily tell that they have no place in the story of the New Testament. They're off the walls out in left field. Those didn't happen the way that a YouTube video you watched said it happened. And so the kind of concept to hear about good study you got to find some good resources if you want to study about this, and you need to study it all. Not just the bits and pieces, the pick-and-choose gospel that you like. The movie theater is not a good place to learn about this, number two. Number three, if you watched a YouTube video about it, I can also show you YouTube videos about ancient aliens. Okay? Let's talk about going to good places to learn about good source material. All right? But we don't even have to have that conversation here today, and some of y'all are very grateful that we're not. If a Christian says that the man corrupted the gospel to the point of complete destruction of the revelation, you're making two big, bold statements. That first one is this. Man is stronger than God. If man could destroy the revelation of Jesus Christ, then man is stronger than Jesus. Man beat Jesus then. And if you want to believe that, now we're in the territory of faith. We're not in a territory of evidence. You're saying that man is stronger than God. Number two, if you're saying this, therefore God isn't God. If man is truly stronger than God, to the point that when God speaks, man can destroy it and cover it up, then that God isn't God anyhow. So there's no point to all of this. What's sad is that there's brethren I know that started this journey of trying to figure out whether the New Testament was Scripture or not. They went to bad places for bad evidence. And you know where they are right now? They're in atheism. They just finally had to throw out everything. Because this is just such a degrading cycle of hurt. Is the New Testament Scripture, there's a huge consequence for saying no, right? Of course, I believe in Psalm 119. He says, your testimonies I have taken as a heritage forever. Meaning when God spoke, he planned on them to be passed down. And God can preserve his word through all time. We just talked about the consequences of saying no to the New Testament being scripture. Let's finish here with the blessing of saying yes. Is the New Testament scripture? The apostles say yes, so I say yes. There's blessings that come with that. Just to share two passages. The first one I would take would be Romans 1.16 that talks about that blessing. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. If I believe in the gospel and I believe it's from the apostles and I agree with the apostles, what do I got? I got salvation even for me, a Gentile that was never born there, has never, well, I've been there once now. I wish I had now because that would have been good. As a Gentile that doesn't know anything about it, that's late to the party, I get to partake in salvation, don't I? Because the gospel is the scripture. Well, the other one I would give with John 20. John finishes his book, and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. If you believe the apostles are true and you believe the apostles were authoritative and their books were scripture, then you have eternal life. That's confidence, isn't it? You have hope. This life, really, this isn't it. There's more. And we're expecting more because we believe in the apostles and we believe that the New Testament is scripture. Thank you for uh, listening to this and, and being engaged with me through this period of worship. Um, Obviously something that I'd like to talk more about if you have questions. Uh, if you have doubts and you need to talk to someone about that, please come and talk to us. Uh, you know, I'm not going to make fun of you. I'm not here to make fun of names. I'm not going to go and tell others that you believe this way. But what I can do is provide some scriptural evidence to help you in your faith. Uh, and Jesus can help us in our faith if we simply seek him to do so.
Is there anyone here that already believes all these things? You believe that the New Testament is Scripture. You believe in Jesus. You believe that the apostles are speaking the truth. Then my only question is, what are you waiting for? If you already believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you believe in the New Testament, you believe you're condemned of sin, you believe that you need to act on that sin and have Jesus wash it away, the power of his blood, then what are you waiting for? It was the only question given to the eunuch, right? Well, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Well, I do. Please let us assist you with that uh, this morning, if you're ready to do that. If anyone needs the prayers of the congregation as well, something that you've been dealing with, we'd like to assist with that. If you will come forward as we stand and sing. When